Good afternoon. My name is Allison Baker. I'm a partner here at Venables Consumer Financial Services Practice. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Um, this is a webinar that is an overview of the CFPB's final arbitration rulemaking. Um, today we're going to be talking about three major topics. One, what the rule itself says, how we got here, some of the history behind it. We're also going to be discussing the Bureau more generally, the CFPB more generally, and the rulemaking process there. And finally, we're going to be talking a bit about uh, some of the perceived and, and likely challenges to this rule in the near future. And then we will wrap it up with some uh, lo other thoughts. Um, we always um, invite questions. Feel free to um, email in any questions that you have, and we will do our very best to address them during the flow of our discussion and or at the end. Um, if for some reason we don't immediately answer your question, rest assured at the end of the uh, webinar we will get back in touch with you. Um, in addition, we will be offering CLE credits. Um, please stay tuned for the uh, CLE code, which we'll be announcing at the very end of this webinar. Um, and you should also know that our webinar today will be uh, recorded and downloadable, and the slides will be, be available later this week on our website, venable.com. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, before we begin, I want to introduce my um, really esteemed colleagues who are here today to walk us through a lot of these different areas. Um, John Cooney, um, who is an expert on all things administrative. He was recently elected head of the American Bar Association's Administrative and Regulatory Affairs Committee. We're very lucky to have him. He'll be walking us through some of the likely challenges, both congressional and court-based, to this rule. Um, my colleague, Andy Arculin, who is an expert on all things having to do with rulemaking at the CFPB. He was previously in the CFPB's rulemaking office and is a longtime consumer finance attorney. And my colleague, Peter Frechette, who is um, Venable's in-house expert on the arbitration rulemaking itself and knows pretty much every detail of the rule and the report that preceded it. Um, I'm Allison Baker, and I'm uh, fortunate to be the moderator for this great panel. So let's get started. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to talk a bit about the rule itself, and we're going to start by asking Peter to give us an overview of what the rule, the final rulemaking says, um, how it's different or not different from what was initially proposed, and also some of the reporting um, that was required under Section 1028 of the Dodd-Frank Act that preceded the rulemaking, because in the context of this particular rule, that's, that's really mission critical. Uh, so, Peter, if you can start maybe with a timeline and some of the specifics of the rule itself. Absolutely. Thanks, Allison. Um, so, hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to start with just a quick overview of some of the more recent and some of the upcoming dates on the, the arbitration rule timeline. Obviously, the, the NPRM came out in uh, May of 2016, and then um, had the comment period, and the final uh, rule was published this summer, July 19th. There are a few upcoming dates. Obviously, we're approaching the effective rule, the effective date of the final rule, um, which, due to the operation of the underlying statute, is not sort of the the real date that everyone is going to be focused on. But it does kick off the start of the uh, the clock to get to the compliance date. Uh, the compliance deadline will be uh, next year, March 19th, and then we have some some future deadlines in 2019 for the public posting of some um, arbitration uh, outcomes and, and records uh, under the rule. So the, what this timeline doesn't really capture is a lot of the, the work that went on before. I mean, the um, Section uh, 1028 of, of Dodd-Frank really kicked off this, this process, and the Bureau followed it up a few years later um, with some initial studies uh, culminating in, in a final study and report that they put out in uh, 2015 that really looked at you know, what, you know, what the arbitration did and didn't do for consumers. They attempted to analyze the cost of arbitration um, to consumers, the benefits of arbitration versus class action lawsuits uh, to consumers. And that, that study really you know, forms, forms the basis of the rule. It's also statutorily required. So it, it is uh, sort of worked into the underlying you know, structure of the rule, and, and Andy will, will get into a little bit more of that and how that's going to affect you know, you know, everything moving forward and in the, the second part of this presentation. So just to, to quickly you know, recap, the arbitration rule looks very similar 
to uh, what you saw when you looked at the proposal. Um, there was you know, some, some changes on the margins and really just cleaning up language and, and focusing in on the, the Bureau's core, um, core focus of the rule, which is eliminating um, class action waivers in arbitration agreements. So that, that um, core elimination is still there. Um, you are barred from, from relying on class action um, waivers in arbitration agreements uh, that are entered into after the compliance deadline, which will be uh, March 19th, 2018. Uh, the, the second element of the rule is mandatory language. The, the main disclosure that will need to be included in arbitration agreements after the compliance deadline um, is, is shown on the screen. And there are alternative disclosures to address um, certain alternative issues that are included in the rule. And then a third part, which kind of, you know, falls a little bit to the wayside when you know, the, the, the big core element is obviously eliminating the class action waiver, but there's also a reporting requirement to, to the extent you are still engaging, and people will, um, in arbitration after the compliance uh, deadline, you will have to file you know, information with the Bureau, which will be publicly posted about ar arbitral claims, awards, and other details. Um, and and that, that's an element that you know, should not, I, I don't think, take you know, take a back seat, but really works in parallel with the, the actual elimination of the class action waiver. And it really will be sort of a, a technical hurdle that people will have to have to address um, if we, we end up going all the way through to the compliance deadline. Peter, when you talk about the class action waiver, um, can you give us a little more, and maybe I know that that's further on in your presentation, but maybe you can just describe for us a little bit of what's contemplated by the final rule. Um, and some of the specifics, um, as I know the devil's in the details, like all rulemaking. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so if you look at the, the scope of the rule, um, you will not be able to rely on class action waivers, which are in your, your arbitration agreements, uh, that are entered into after the compliance date. So, I mean, essentially the, the class action waiver functions to ensure that a consumer that has agreed to your, you know, your contract for your product or service um, agrees not to participate in a class action, but instead go to arbitration uh, to resolve disputes arising out of that contract. The term entered into is statutory language. So it's, it's language given to the Bureau in 1028D, uh, but it's not defined. So they've interpreted entered into uh, throughout this rule and what, what it means for a uh, you know, consumer financial product or service agreement to be entered into. It's going to be broader, um, as you'll see in the rule, than just you know, a cutoff at the March 19th. So every, every new contract after, after March 19th will be covered, but also if you're adding a new product or service to an existing contract um, and you know, other, other amendments um, that sort of fall within the Bureau's interpretation of entering into a new contract for products or services is going to function to make sure that yeah, even, even some of your existing contracts might need to be you know, amended or you, you may not be able to rely on the uh, uh, arbitration um, class action waiver and uh, need to provide a disclosure. Um, so it's the, the products and services that are affected are are pretty much what you would what you would expect and is very similar to what was proposed by the Bureau. It's going to be core financial products and services, consumer lending, um, providers of credit, uh, including deferred third-party billing services, um, consumer credit, um, monitoring, servicing, repair, debt relief, debt collection, including <coughs> spending and brokering automobile leases, storing, transmitting, exchanging funds. So, you know, engaging with the movement of money is really going to trigger this. The um, applicable term is going to be a provider. So a provider of these services is, is going to be what's covered under, under the Act, which is going to be a little bit more narrow than the Bureau, Bureau's whole scope of a covered person under Dodd-Frank. So let's just back up for a second. When you talk about covered person, that, of course, is the definition under the Consumer Financial Protection Act, which is Title X of Dodd-Frank, that describes um, the conduct over which the CFPB has some um, authority. And so your point mm -hmm. is that that 
that universe of actors and conduct is narrower for the arbitration rule, albeit not much narrower, right? Mm -hmm. There's right. a few exceptions, but not too many. That's right. Um, which is important, too, because when you start talking about consumer-facing agreements in financial services products, uh, both once and future financial services products, you really have to be thinking about mm -hmm. um, the way that this rule could impact not only existing contracts, but new ones, which is your point. Absolutely. Um, and, and even even contracts you may not necessarily <coughs> be a party to, but a servicer, for example, is going to be prohibited from relying on a class action waiver within an agreement under which they're servicing, you know, regarding disputes arising under that agreement, even if the originating party is not covered by the rule. So the, the servicers are really going to have to pay attention to that. And that, that reliance element of the, uh, the um, ban, the bar of the class action waiver, really might function to, to broaden the effective scope of the rule, not what's in writing, but sort of what happens in the real world out a little bit further than, than what the rule says. Because if your servicers can't rely on an, you know, a class action waiver in your agreement, even if you might not necessarily as a, as a company be covered, are you really going to include that in your contracts and then put your servicers in kind of a bind? Um, that that will, will remain to be seen, but it, it will sort of work to, um, I think, push the edges of the rule out a little bit further even than, than what's in writing. Um, Andy, I want to ask you before we move on, um, because Andy, of course, was one of the people who, who were boots on the ground at the outset of the CFPB, as was I. Um, this concept of service provider, which is something Andy and I talk about all the time in our practice, um, it's somewhat nebulous, isn't it? I mean, it's defined under the statute, but, you know, if you ask a bunch of people, are you a service provider, um, sometimes people know the answer to that question, sometimes they don't. And so to Peter's point, you could be a service provider who falls within the scope of this rule offering services to an entity that may not, and you're on the hook for this rule even if the entity to which you're providing those services is not. And I don't know what your thoughts are about that, and I know you're going to talk to us a little yeah, more about the rule in a few minutes. But. That's right. You know, keep in mind this is about the agreements that you form with consumers when you contract with them, right? So if you're not allowed to have a class action waiver in your contract, if, if a binding arbitration clause with a class action waiver in your contract, you couldn't get around that by having your service provider do it. You, you would be bound by the contract you formed with the consumer, so you wouldn't be able to get out of a class action just because you're using a service provider who may or may not be covered. And then to Allison's point, you know, service provider is, is an open-ended term. It really depends on which statute and which rule you're talking about, whether, you know, whether it's limited to certain types of financial services providers or not. And it's something you have to analyze case by case. And you know that what what makes this rulemaking interesting, it's not done under the traditional statutes, you know, truth and lending, RESPA, ECOA that the CFPB administers, where there are a defined universe of terms, where everyone does know what the scope is. This is something new that the CFPB did through rulemaking. Um, and that's really interesting. And we're gonna we're gonna hold on to that thought for a moment yeah. um, because I want to talk more about that um, in a few minutes. Um, the idea that a lot of the rulemaking um, <clears throat> that the CFPB is involved with, of course, comes from inherent authorities in the enumerated uh, consumer finance laws that it enforces. Of course, the Consumer Financial Protection Act is one of those laws as well, but this is unique to that law, and we'll talk about that in a few yes. minutes. Um, Peter, if you can continue kind of walking us through what this rule says and its contemplated uh, you know, function, if you will, and, and how it's going to ultimately be implemented. Well, we, we've, you know, we're sort of, we're sort of there, you know, we, we, with the, the bar, the ban of the, the class action waiver, and then the, you know, mandatory disclosures, which uh, you'll need to include, and then the reporting. Those, those three elements are really it. And there are, there are some exclusions. Um, you know, some, some companies are carved out if you're regulated by the SEC or the CFTC. You know, there, there are those. Um, but again, the, the rule itself, like we saw with the proposal, is a core very very straightforward and I think the sort of the how it plays out in practice will be in how people end up complying um, and the effects of compliance really more so than trying to comply with a you know, very nitty-gritty rule um, as we, we, we've seen some in some of the past rules but this one compliance will be fairly simple and straightforward but what happens after compliance will get will get pretty tricky um, so with that I mean Andy, Andy started um, getting into it a little bit but 
um, this, the rule stems from um, Section 1028 of Dodd-Frank, and so it is sort of the Bureau's throwaway to discretionary rulemaking. So we'll, uh, we'll get into the, the path of the rule and um, have him get into that discussion. Um, and before we start, Andy, you'll, you'll walk us through um, one of the things that I think is helpful for our audience to understand, and Andy has a unique line of sight into this because when he worked at the Bureau, he worked on both mandatory rulemaking, that is rulemaking mandated by the Dodd-Frank Act, other, other titles of the Dodd-Frank Act, but also some discretionary rulemaking and has a good understanding of the distinctions there, both in terms of rulemaking itself, um, derivative authority from the relevant statutes, but also some of the policy issues that kind of swirl around discretionary rulemaking. Um, and I think that those are really important to understand. And also, of course, the the um, study itself that was in fact mandated by the by the yep. statute, and that precedes this. So, if you can kind of give us a little bit of a line of sight into those issues now, that would be really helpful, I think, for our audience. No, sure thing. So, um, happy to do that. And you know, what I'm going to do, and much of this will be laying the groundwork for my colleague John Cooney, who's going to talk about all the potential ways that this rule could ultimately be challenged. One thing that makes this rule unique, you know, Allison and Peter both mentioned that it's a, it's a quote, discretionary rulemaking, meaning the CFPB was not told by Congress that they have to go out and ban class action waivers and arbitration clauses or require reporting. This was something the CFPB, you know, believes that it had authority to do because it conducted a study as it was directed and also has a degree of authority under the Dodd-Frank Act to make rules consistent with that study that are in the public interest. But it's different from you know, most of the rulemakings I worked on at the CFPB, which many of them were around mortgage. And if you remember, you know, before the, what, why the CFPB was formed was because the housing and mortgage markets exploded or imploded, uh, or both. And um, you know, the, the CFPB was tasked with implementing the Dodd-Frank Act. You know, Title 14 of the Dodd-Frank Act were a bunch of blueprints for rules um, passed by Congress, where Congress decided that you were not going to, if you're a mortgage lender, you were not going to be able to make a mortgage to someone unless you made a reasonable good faith determination that they had an ability to repay the loan. And much of the work that we did at the CFPB was figuring out, you know, what's workable for the industry, what properly balances consumer protection with access to credit and so on, where the statutory framework was there. Um, notice and comment was much more constructive, where, you know, the Bureau would go and propose rules, they'd propose safe harbors, exemptions, uh, mechanisms for compliance, and so on. <clears throat> and the industry would comment and say, you know, wait a minute, that's not quite broad enough. You know, we, we need more help. The CFPB would have to balance those comments out, but, but it was a much more constructive process. At the end of the day, everyone was, everyone was comfortable with the fact that these rules were going to be law, they were going to exist, and they were going to have to comply with them. What makes this different is, you know, this was something the CFPB did that was inherently controversial from the from the outset. Um, you know, it, it's the CFPB, you know, as we'll get into in a minute, had the authority to do a study. They had authority to, you know, to make rules that were consistent with the study and in the public interest. But they did not have to do, go as broad as they did. They didn't have to make a determination that class action waivers are inherently bad. You know, that's ultimately what they what they did. So, you know, it, it's important just to, to lay that out, you know, th this was, you know, th there's, it's not the only discretionary rulemaking that the CFPB's done, but this and the forthcoming payday lending rule are night and day different from most of the rules that the CFPB has done thus far, because this is really the CFPB making its own policy determination and making a rule and making policy through rule without a statute directly behind it. Um, one of the things I, I wanted to come back to Peter on briefly, I know you spent some time looking at this, um, you know, last year, I guess, when the, or maybe a little while before that, when the report came out. But, but one of the interesting issues here, which I know Andy's going to speak more about and John is also going to speak more about, is how calibrated the mandatory study is with the discretionary rulemaking. Um, there's a lot of thought, and I, you know, I don't, I, it's hard to know, you know, how, how, accurate all of this is, but there's a lot of thought that the study itself um, came up with certain conclusions. Um, there are some thoughts that that study is limited and that those conclusions don't necessarily track the full scope of the rule. 
um, which of course is could be a grounds, I suspect, for challenge to the rule ultimately, and John will talk more about that, and Andy can as well. But Peter, can you can you talk a little bit more about you know what what the report itself did, and it was fairly extensive, and what was its kind of you know high highlights, if you will? Sure. The report looked at um, sort of a. Um, you know, they set out to study uh, arbitration uh, agreements. Um, the report looked at credit card lenders, and it looked at one arbitral body, um, and it sort of from there explored um, the differences, similarities and differences between consumers going through arbitration, including you know, the cost to the consumer to engage in arbitration, the rate at which uh, consumers, individual consumers, succeeded or failed on their claims in arbitration, um, and the, you know, the uh, outcome, the eventual outcome, what consumers got from that arbitration, compared that to the, the Bureau's analysis of, um, during the same time period, class action lawsuits involving classes of consumers pursuing similar claims. Um, it, it also took a, uh, an antitrust settlement um, several credit card, major credit card companies, and tried to figure out whether or not and to what extent costs might be pushed down to consumers if arbitration was to suddenly go away and, and class actions to sort of come back into the fore. Because recall previously under the Supreme Court's uh, precedent in Concepcion and that line of cases, uh, arbitration has sort of become the standard and there really has been very little in this space uh, class action exposure or liability, and so one of the one of the questions, and I think it from the study was something the bureau was trying to head off, was to show that no, you know, the costs, added costs, such as um, most most people expect um, to be priced into products, really really won't be. They'll they'll be absorbed in different ways, and unfortunately, that that using the, the uh, antitrust settlement was largely, I think statistically inconclusive, and um, even within other credit card companies, I don't know if it's going to be all that helpful as, as the Bureau goes to support you know, that, that particular line of argument, which is consumers are going to bear the brunt of, of this rule because companies, you know, as, you know, as reasonably they will, just kind of price in added risk. You know? um, even if, if it's not certain yet, you have certainly a large, a large amount of new uncertainty should this rule go all the way through to the compliance date of you know, what, what, what is our exposure to, to class actions now. And you know, we have several years where you don't have a whole lot of data, so it, it's going to be hard to figure out. It's going to be a, a fairly large uncertainty gap, which does increase costs. And where those costs ultimately end up, I, I don't think was answered in the study, although I think the Bureau tried. Um, but that will be... Uh, sort of a, a line of argument, I'm sure, um, in the you know in the challenges to the rule. Yeah, and I would add, I mean, the, the bureau did make a conclusion <clears throat> that they that there is a lack of evidence that you know that class act the risk of class action lawsuits was passed on to consumers. They they did you know they they did make that finding in their study, and that's one of the weaknesses that's been pointed out is that they didn't really have a complete data set. There's no way that they could have made that determination. And then inherently, you know, massive class actions that cost companies a lot of money ultimately do raise the cost of doing business. And, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch going back to economics class. That's ultimately going to be passed on to consumers. Granted, it's a little more complicated than that because there's a market that sets its own prices. But if everyone's exposed to the same risk and the cost of doing business is raised because the compliance bar is raised or whatever, I, you know, I, it's... It's unlikely that that wouldn't be passed on to consumers, at least to some degree. And, and the CFPB, you know, made a finding, but th there's question of whether they had support behind it. Right, and the, the and something you, you don't see in the study because it's very you, it's almost impossible put, to put a number on, but it's heavily um, sort of cited in, in the you know, uh, preamble to the, the final rule, which is that the bureau yeah, has put forward the fact that. The you know, existence of class action lawsuits allows a group of consumers to mod, you know, modulate or control or change uh, a company's behavior, um, whereas individual consumers going through arbitration don't have necessarily that, that power. Although, the, but that is, you know, wasn't really included as a quantifiable element in the study. You know, the study looked at what does a consumer get 
personally from arbitration versus what a consumer get personally from class action. Um, and that so so that that cost and benefit, you know, what what is what is the, the monetary benefit to the to an individual consumer of the ability for a class to sort of change the business practices of a company or all of an industry um, in, a, in a certain way. And that the Bureau sort of relied on that, I think, heavily in the preamble and justification for the rule, but that's not been studied. And, and I don't, you know, it would be very difficult, I think, to study that and put that in monetary terms so that you could stack it up against, you know, what individual consumers can get monetarily out of arbitration. And, you know, the great unknown here, of course, is not just the risk that we know today, but the way that this risk could be computed in terms of taking new products to market, um, innovation in general, a willingness to maybe take a certain risk in the marketplace by introducing a more novel product. Um, I think there's also an unknown as to, you know, the, the, the financial services world is so dynamic and it's changing so quickly and there are companies today that may not be so-called financial services providers under this rule that might be in three or four years and does this uh, rule in any way quell that, um, it, it, you know, quell that instinct to develop a product that falls within the scope of the rule or not? You know, those are unknowns um, and I know John is, is probably going to talk a, a little bit about that as well in some of the, in some of the you know, discussion about the challenge, and I don't know if you have some thoughts now about that. Or to continue, I'll yeah. pick it up. Yeah. Um, I would even yeah. take, it, take it a step further, actually, and say, um, you know, it kind of chills innovation within arbitration itself. Um, and I think you, you, you see a lot of development of sort of streamlined and online arbitration in different ways that consumers can resolve disputes with companies that they, you know, they work with and a couple of contracts with on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and presumably, you know, a lot of a lot of support from that came from the fact that arbitration was so prevalent and you know existed everywhere in large part, um, I'm sure, due to the fact that it also served as a class action waiver for the the companies that put it in place in their agreements, so that. The Bureau has taken the step, and Andy and John, I'm sure we'll, we'll get to this too, of saying no to the class action waiver. Um, it didn't necessarily need to do that. There was no requirement, as Andy was pointing right. out, there was no statute that said you, the CFPB, um, for the statute, should implement, put rules in place to implement the statute to ban class action waivers. The CFPB could have um, done some other sort of regulation, some a more of a finer grain regulation of arbitration within the financial services sector and sort of had do's and don'ts and different rules for how you should go about arbitration um, when, you know, still maintaining a more traditional, at least for the last couple of years, setup of waiving class actions and really funneling everything into arbitration, but then figuring out how that should play out and setting rules in that space and allowing that space to continue to develop a little bit so that, you know, if I'm a consumer, I can just get online and quickly solve my dispute when something happens rather than, you know, either going through traditional formal arbitration or you know, joining a class and, and getting a, a gift certificate for, for $5 or something. I don't mean to belittle the, uh, the amount, that the value of the, the class action lawsuit to consumers, but there is, there is that difference monetarily in, in the outcome for individual consumers. Yeah, and I'd add, I mean, the, the CFPB, and this, this is consistent with, you know, with, with what I had coming up anyway, but the CFPB took a very, you know, positive, sanguine view of class action litigation, right? They, they made a determination that, you know, based on the data that they reviewed, there were consumers who were eligible for relief who didn't get it because, you know, and they, I think, concluded largely because they were not able to access class actions. Um, but they didn't really talk about class action lawsuits that are filed as, you know, quote, cat, copycat lawsuits. One company does something wrong, then, you know, maybe attorneys go out and try the same theory against a bunch of other companies, and they have to defend lawsuits. There's still expenses that they incur. They have to defend the lawsuits. Sometimes they have to go through discovery. Sometimes they settle lawsuits that, aren't, that don't even have merit. And, and you know, the, this is a, a reality of the legal landscape. You know, if you, if you just look at the economics, Sometimes it's easier just to to pay you know to, just to pay some hush money to the to the opposing counsel than it is to litigate the case and win. So you know they they didn't really look into that. They really took the view that class actions benefit consumers. 
that you know, I, I think they also didn't really look at you know, the differences between settlements. It was really awards versus awards. That, that was a, lar a large part of their focus. And you know, how much do consumers, to Peter's point, you know, how much do consumers really get out of a class action settlement? I know I've had a few myself where I got somewhere in the neighborhood of $20. Um, you know, is, is that really helping consumers? It's unclear. Um, you know, or you know, as the you know, the, some of the some of the folks who submitted comments pointed out, is it more helping, you know, helping spur litigation where it may not actually be benefiting anyone? Those are the the policy debates. Those are the issues that are really front and center to this rule. Is is this really needed? You know, especially when you have a zealous consumer protection agency like the CFPB who can go out and has the resources to enforce. You know, do you need private attorneys general who may have other motives other than consumer protection in mind, um, or you know, is, is this an overstep? I mean, those those were all you know those were all issues that, that were debated in the rule, and I think will continue to be debated. Um, switching back to you know the, the slide that's on here, it's this is the statutory provision. Peter touched on it some. I wanted to lay lay some of the groundwork for John when he gets into potential avenues for challenge, just by setting up. Is this was the authority that the CFPB had for the rule. Um, you know, going back to the discretionary versus mandatory, you know, there, there is not a, a framework in place that Congress passed and said, here's the statute. We want you to fill in the gaps and, and issue rules and determine, you know, what the scope of coverage is and so on. This was really it. The, the CFPB was directed to do the study that we've been talking about, and they went out and did it, and they did it, you know, in a, in a timely fashion, there was a preliminary report in 2013, a, a final report in 2015. Um, but you know, other than that, they have they, they do have a, an obligation. If you look at the second further authority, that really is about rulemaking. They have you know, they don't have a mandate to make a rule. They have the authority to make a rule that's consistent with the study and <coughs> is in the public interest and for the protection of consumers. And if you go, you know, look look at the at the docket for the rulemaking, and you read some of the comment letters, most of the comments are really aimed at the bureau failing one to all three of those tests. Is it consistent with the study? Is it in the public interest? And is it for the protection of consumers? That raises all these questions about, you know, whether arbitration is good or bad, whether class actions benefit consumers or not, and so on. And there really is a fundamental disagreement, I think, between the CFPB and, and, and much of the industry who submitted comments about those questions. The other thing I, I'd add, you know, th this is uh, you know, the next slide. It's, it's part of the CFPB's normal rulemaking process. They have to do what's called a 1022 or an economic impacts analysis. This is something the CFPB does even for, even for mandatory rulemakings where they, they do have that framework in place. The Bureau has an obligation under the Dodd-Frank Act to go and consider the costs and benefits. Um, you know, this is the Office of Research, Markets, and Regulations is where I, I worked at the CFPB. Regulations are the lawyers like myself. Markets are, you know, supposed to be industry experts, and then research are economists. The economists are the ones who are tasked with doing this 1022 analysis. And, you know, one thing I'd point out, it, it, it's called a cost-benefit analysis, but really all that's required under 1022 is that the economist considers the costs and considers the benefits, both the consumers and the affected parties. It doesn't require that the, that the, the benefits outweigh the costs or anything like that. It's basically just a consideration test. The CFPB has to make a record. It has to be in there and so on. But one little wrinkle for this rule is, you know, there is that public interest and for the protection of consumers and consistency with the study, there's all three of those hurdles that the CFPB has to meet. And if, you know, if you're going and looking for a means to challenge the CFPB and claim that they didn't meet those factors, the 1022 analysis is really, you know, where you go, um, because that tells you what they considered and what they didn't. It tells you, you know, what they consider the cost and the benefits to be. And if there's something that's glaringly left out or missed, you know, that's where you would, you, you would point it out and you would say they did not consider this or they didn't properly make a determination that this was in the public interest because they missed something and they missed something really big. So, you know, that's getting into, you know, getting, getting more into the avenues for challenge, but that's why we're talking about this 1022 section as, as well as the authority just to make the rule. Um, Andy, one of the, the things I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, so when I was at the CFPB in 2011, even before the agency started, 
Um, there was discussion about the arbitration rulemaking, or I shouldn't even say rulemaking because it wasn't necessarily contemplated that there would be a rule, but there was discussion about the study and a need to look at arbitration and the effects that mandatory arbitration clauses have on consumers and the offering of consumer-facing financial products and services. And my entire time at the agency, for the first couple of years of the agency, um, this was an issue that just kind of kept percolating. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that was your experience as well. I was in enforcement, and, and there were folks in enforcement talking about it, and this isn't a state secret. Everybody knows that. There were people all over the, the CFPB talking about it. There were a wide range of offices who had representatives convened to discuss this issue and figure out how to craft a rule, um, if there was going to be a rule, but more importantly, how to design a report and a study. And I'm wondering what your experience was, was with that, because I think that this is an issue that has been around for a while. Um, 1028 was clearly contemplated in the Dodd-Frank Act in response to Concepcion, which is the Supreme Court case, Concepcion versus AT&T, that effectively, for lack of a better way to describe it, basically said mandatory arbitration clauses and consumer-facing agreements are lawful. Um, subsequently, uh, Italian Colors, which was another case, um, you know, affirmed that um, with some slight nuances. But this is an issue that's been percolating in the consumer protection yep. world for years. What was your experience at the Bureau? So, uh, you know, <laughs> and it's actually, it raises a really good point, which is this was something that clearly was on Congress's mind. And, you know, one of the provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act that we're not talking about because it's ancient history now was the provision of the Dodd-Frank Act that said you cannot have a binding arbitration clause or a class action waiver in a mortgage contract, right? right? That was part of the Dodd-Frank statute, and that was done in one of the very first rulemakings. It was actually part of the loan originator compensation rule just because it got tacked on, but it really was its own provision of the Dodd-Frank Act. And, you know, that is evidence that Congress did think that there at least could be a problem with, with binding arbitration and class action waivers, at least for some credit products. Another example is the Military Lending Act, which wasn't done, you know, it doesn't, wasn't even done by the CFPB. But, you know, the Military Lending Act said that for contracts with service members, you can't have mandatory arbitration clauses. So those are two examples of this already being on the radar, this already being thought about as a potential issue for consumer protection, and then I think what the CFPB was given the authority to do is explore all the other financial products and classes of borrowers. I and mean, keep in mind, mortgage is a very specific type of financial product, and then military lending is a very specific type of borrower, mm -hmm. right? Both of which get their own protections. This is all the area in between. And I think Congress had not reached conclusions yet. They had given, they'd given this to the CFPB to go out and study and make conclusions about, but it wasn't like this was something that where the CFPB just went off on a wild hair and decided they were going to go after arbitration clauses. There was a groundwork laid. Um, there were already prohibitions in place, as you know now. And, um, and this was something that really um, <laughs> informed at the very early stages of the Dodd-Frank debate. This was an issue that was being discussed. Um, it was a little bit different, obviously, than some of the, um, the, the, the immediate reasons that gave rise to the Dodd-Frank Act, such as the financial crisis, but this is an issue that's been out there for a long time. And I, I think that's important to note um, because it informs some of the um, ammunition that I think the Bureau has had in not only um, obviously creating the study, which it was required to do, but in subsequently promulgating a rule, which was of course discretionary. Um, and I note that because I think as, as we go forward and we observe challenges which are likely to come to this rule, a lot of what the Bureau does is going to be, I think, from a, from a high-level political view, inextricably linked with the way this rule plays itself out. And one of the interesting things, which John will talk to us some more about in a few minutes, um, is a lot of the folks who are lining up or potentially lining up to oppose this rule are not necessarily actors who are vociferous opponents of the CFPB. Um, you know, there's definitely that, that cadre of voices in D.C., but these aren't necessarily those same people. Some of them are, but a lot of them are not, um, because this is seen as such a fundamental issue for how you manage risk in the consumer products market more generally, um, which I think is, I, I just think all of this is critical when we start talking about the way the rule came about, which Andy's going to spend a little more time explaining to us, and then some of the um, policy slash politics swirling around it, both in and outside of the CFPB. 
Um, and if you can walk us through, we've talked a little bit about the arbitration study already, um, yep. but if you, you know, if there's some other thoughts that you have that you'd like to add to that, and also talk to us a little bit about the way the mechanics of the rulemaking itself happened. Again, because this informs not only the way the rule ultimately came about, but some potential challenges that could be forthcoming. Sure. So uh, we have we have talked quite a bit about the study. Uh, it's obviously very important to this whole discussion, right? Uh, a few things that that we haven't really, you know, we haven't explored fully. I think, you know, Peter touched on some of them. There were a lot of criticisms of the study, right? And you know, if you think about a potential challenge to this rulemaking, that's really what it comes down to: is the, does the study support the rulemaking? Otherwise, you're really in arb is, is this arbitrary and capricious, or is it not in the public interest? So, you know, anyone who's looking to challenge this has to think about all of them, and that really starts with criticizing the study and, and, and making the argument that the study doesn't support what the CFPB did. You know, some of the, um, it, you know, it, and. I would encourage anyone who is really interested in the history and, and figuring out, you know, what's what's going on with this rule to go look at some of the comments that were filed. You can go to regulations.gov and read them. But, you know, it, it really was a, you know, it was a very confrontational, almost pre-litigation set of comment submissions. And, you know, the industry proponents really were taking the view. If you, if you look at the comment letters, many of them were outlined like an appellate brief where they're preserving their arguments, you know, they're saying this is not in the public interest because this is not for the benefit of consumers because, and this is not consistent with the study because, and, and picking, you know, picking on the proposal in those ways to preserve those arguments as opposed to saying, you know, asking the Bureau for help or asking them to modify something. Um, you know, some of the criticisms of the study that are there, you know, Peter touched on the fact that it was, you know, it, it, it is viewed as very credit card centric. I think most of the data, you know, that the CFPB looked at related to credit cards, but the rule is far more wide-ranging than that. It covers really anything other than mortgages that are already banned or contracts with service members that are already banned, right? You basically have everything else in between. And, you know, the CFPB's conclusions, you know, some, some of the findings that they made, which we've talked <coughs> about a bit, you know, Maybe, maybe it's not, maybe, you know, the CFPB was right that it wasn't transparent to consumers that they were waiving litigation rights or that they were waiving, you know, class action rights by entering into arbitration clauses. Maybe they, they weren't really doing a good job of reading their contracts or maybe it wasn't being explained. But did the CFPB have to go through and ban them or could they have accomplished the same thing through better disclosures, right? I think if you were to go ask, you know, the, the rulemaking team of the CFPB or, you know, read through the rule, they would say that disclosures wouldn't accomplish it because people don't necessarily have the choice to, to reject an arbitration clause when they're contracting for a credit card or something like that. You basically apply for credit and you sign the agreement that you get, and, you know, that's their opposing view. I think, you know, some of the industry would say, well, what if we made them optional and gave people a, a, a better disclosure? That really wasn't borne out in the rule. The CFPB really just chose the path and stuck with it. Um, you know, the others, which we talked about before, the CFPB made a determination that consumers who were eligible for relief weren't getting it. You know, that, that may be true, but, you know, it, it, sometimes we're talking about an inadvertent violation that is $5, a $5 fee or something like that. You know, one of the things the CFPB probably could have done a, a more thorough job exploring is, you know, what, you know, what level of consumer harm, actual consumer harm is not redressed, and, you know, why couldn't the CFPB and other regulators do it on, on their behalf? Does it need to go through plaintiffs, class action lawyers? You know, that, that's a good question, and it, it applies beyond the CFPB to the FTC, to the state's attorneys general, and so on. But they didn't, you know, they didn't really seem to get into whether it was necessary for to open the door to, to class actions. You know, and, you know, the other part of that is there, there are consumers who are eligible for relief that the CFPB doesn't necessarily give restitution to. They may go in and do an examination and find, you know, find that a company got a rule wrong and they're charging a fee that they can't charge and they're not giving a disclosure and penalize them or just tell them to fix it, right, which is what any regulators do. They don't necessarily take restitution every time you do something wrong, this really opens the door for opportunistic litigation. And did the CFPB really explore that and really get into the consequences? You know, I, I think the industry commenters would argue that they don't. The CFPB would argue that they did, but that's all left to be decided. Um, you know, 
And you know, there, there also were, you know, there were industries and there were specific statutes that the CFPB, the study was criticized for not really getting into. You know, there's statutes like CROA and the TCPA where class action damages are catastrophic, right? There's other statutes where, like TILA, where they're capped at a million dollars, right? Did, did the CFPB really go in and parse that out? And determine, you know, determine whether the, it was appropriate here, or not there. You know, again, it's really a one-size-fits-all rule based on a one-size-fits-all study. Um, so that's, you know, a little more context around the study and how we can, you know, how people have criticized it through their comment letters. How we can probably expect people to criticize it moving forward. Um, we'll go into the proposal real quickly. You know, the, the proposal was, you know, Peter's already done a good job laying out both the proposal and the final rule. This reiterates the timelines. One thing I wanted to point out here is that there are over 100,000 comments submitted. So this was a rule that was a really big deal to a lot of people. Um, there are comments done by trade associations, individual companies, you know, consumer groups, and so on. And you know, they're they're really across the spectrum. Um, it's a very controversial rule. You know, there's there's some who love it and some who hate it, and you know, very few in between. So it, it, it's, you know, it, again, it, it's not one of those rulemakings that lends itself to, you know, someone ironing out the kinks and hammering out the details and reaching a consensus for what everyone can live with. It really is all or nothing. And, you know, the last point here, you know, really kind of tees up John's part of the presentation, which is if you read the CFPB's final rule and the way that they address comments, it's very clear. Their, 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 their addressing of comments is there to say, we got a comment that made this argument and we disagree with it over and over and over again. And, you know, they really, it's, it's, it's very, you know, it's very much a rebuttal paper to the comments that they got. And, you know, that's really it. And it, I think it, it really opens up for, you know, where everyone expects this to go, which is some sort of a challenge. Andy, um, on that note, um, before we discuss some of the challenges, um, <coughs> or potential challenges, the, the idea, and if you, if you look at the Bureau's rule, which is pretty daunting, I'm staring at a binder sitting on our desk in front of all of us, which is about 500 pages double space, or back-to-back -back rather, uh, so single space back-to-back. -back. It's a very long rule. It's about 850 pages, Peter, I think, um, something like that. Um, a lot of 10 pages yeah, of regulatory yeah, text. Yeah, and 10 pages of regulatory <laughs> text, and yeah. most of it is preamble and or discussions about the substantive comments that came in. Um, in your experience, um, is that a pretty typical amount, not of comments, but a typical way that the Bureau uh, responds to comments in, in further um, justifying or describing or explaining its rulemaking? Well, I mean, like, like I was mentioning before, you know, the, the mortgage rules that I worked on, I, I don't think there was ever a quick, really, there was never even really a threat that they were going to be challenged under the APA. Because Congress had already, Congress had basically already written the blueprint for the rules. There were, there's a very active general counsel's office at the CFPB who's there to protect the agency from making a mistake that could get them sued and get a rule undone, right? Um, or you know, there's there there's these concepts under Administrative Procedures Act law like logical outgrowth and so on, where the you know the general counsel's office will make sure that if the CFPB is doing something that wasn't proposed in the final rule, they've got a good explanation for it. They make sure that they're that they state the authorities that they use for for changes and so on. But generally, the comment process for the mortgage rules was very it was very iterative and collaborative. I would even say, obviously, there were industry participants who disagreed with things, who opposed them, and you know made their case for why the CFPB should do something different. But it wasn't usually, you, you know, you don't have the authority to do this for A, B, and C. It was more, this is going to have more of an impact on our business than you've anticipated, or this is going to be bad for consumers for some reason you haven't participated because we're going to have to jack the price up on them, and there's a, a real reason for that. So the CFPB has a complete record. I, this was the first rulemaking that I've seen where it really was, you know, it, it, it looked like pre-litigation. It, it, it was unique. Um, the payday lending rule, which is very similar to this in the sense that it's discretionary, it's something the CFPB is doing, it's really threatening, life-threatening for an entire industry. That's very similar to the arbitration rule. Most of the other rules, the mandatory rules of the CFPB did, were completely a completely different experience. And by similar, you mean it, it, it's, it's provoked that many comments 
and this kind of back and forth colloquy. Yes, yeah. and, and that's that's a rule that's done under their unfair, deceptive, and abusive authority. And you know, basically, the comments there are saying you have not made your case that this is unfair, deceptive, or abusive, mm -hmm. right? And it, as opposed to saying, well, you know, you should really you should expand this exemption and make it a little looser, and then we can live with it, which is what what I found more for the for the mortgage rules. Interesting. Um, well, thank you. That's really helpful. John, um, I'd love it if you could spend some time kind of walking us through um, some of the potential challenges to the rules. And um, we, we also have um, uh, some, some discussion here, um, not only about the challenges, but about the way the Bureau could foreseeably enforce the rule. Um, and um, I think we can talk a little bit about first the challenges that are facing the rule. And then um, at the end, we can talk about some of the ways that the Bureau could actually, as a functional matter, go about enforcing the rule. And, and, I, and all of us will chime in and talk about that based on our collective experience um, handling enforcement actions and um, supervisory action, or hopefully not action, supervisory endeavors, as well as just general guidance that the, that the Bureau provides. But, but before we get there, um, the rule has to actually be implemented, and um, John's going to help us think through some of the ways that um, the Bureau could face challenges for this rule. Um, so if you would um, walk us through some of that now, John, that would be really helpful. Thank you, Allison. <coughs> um, I want to begin by pointing out that there are alternative approaches available by which opponents could seek to overturn the final rule. And there is a different mechanism available in each branch of our government. Um, first, Congress could adopt a resolution of disapproval of the rule under the Congressional Review Act, which was heavily used in the two months after the Trump administration took office to overturn 14 other rules. Second, within the executive branch, it's possible, and I underline possible, that an administrative action could be taken that would stay, modify, or revoke the final rule. And finally, on the judicial branch, the topic that's been foreshadowed several times here is that there could be lawsuits that challenge the final rule. But let me start you off with the Congressional Review Act. Under the Congressional Review Act, um, the CFPB had to submit the rule to Congress for review before it could come into force. And Congress has the right to disapprove the rule within a defined period of time. Um, the, uh, this is done by a disapproval resolution adopted by each House of Congress and then signed by the President. The House has passed the disapproval resolution, but the Senate has not acted yet. Um, the best estimate I've seen is that the Senate would have to adopt a resolution of disapproval uh, within the statutory 60 session days, which I think runs out on October 29th. That's the 60th session day, that is, not days spent in recess after the CFPB submitted the rule. There are two salient features of the Congressional Review Act, which were um, demonstrated to a fairly well in the two months after the Trump administration took office. First, under the statute, a disapproval resolution cannot be filibustered in the Senate. If the bill is taken up, then the proponents of overturning the rule are guaranteed a vote. Um, and if the second point is, um, if the rule is disapproved through this mechanism, then the CFPB would be barred from adopting a, quote, similar rule, close quote, in the future by the Dodd-Frank Act. Nobody knows what the word similar means. Um, it's never been interpreted by a court. It's completely undecided at, at this point. Does that mean that the CFPB could not adopt any kind of arbitration rule, effectively or finding a way to revoke the provision of the Dodd-Frank Act through this other provision that was enforced? Does that mean that the, um, if uh, people bring challenges on a product-by-product product basis to the rule, does that mean the CFPB could no longer adopt a rule regulating those products? Um, does it mean that there might be some minimum level of evidence required in, before the CFPB could try to um, adopt a prohibition on arbitration clauses in a future rule? Um, there are many, many questions like that that the uh, legal academics are debating like crazy now. But the answer is nobody knows, but it's a significant point. And that's one of the things that factors into the next point, which is potential obstacles in the Senate. Um, the primary um, burden is that the backers have to have um, 50 votes in support of overturning it, which means that the Republicans can only afford to lose three votes. 
um, if there may be people who don't like the rule in its current form, but think that there should be some kind of rule by the CFPB in this space because Congress did adopt um, a provision that authorized the CFPB to look into arbitration clauses. So they may not want to have a total ban on arbitration clauses, but they may want a more considered ban. So the, um, that may, the similar clause may be something that um, is a potential drain on Republican votes looking to overturn the rule. But what proved true under the um, experience in the early Trump administration is perhaps the greatest obstacle was the scarcity of floor time. Um, uh, the um, op opponents of a resolution are entitled to a 10-hour floor debate, so essentially they can consume one day of Senate time just debating pro forma um, whether the rule should be adopted or not when everybody knows it's going to come down to a show of strength at the end. And so congressional leadership would have to decide whether there's other legislation pending in the Senate that is a higher priority and then it bumps out um, a proposed um, resolution to disprove the arbitration rule. So if um, uh, serious discussions on tax reform are on the floor of the Senate, for example, it might reduce the chances of the opponents of the um, uh, arbitration rule to use the legislative branch mechanism to try to knock it out. So assuming that Congress doesn't knock this out, we turn to the executive branch and what could happen there. Um, it is technically possible for the administrative officials to stay, modify, or revoke the final rule. The way this would work is that if Director Cordray resigns, as is brooded about in the press every day, the president would have the congressional authority, the constitutional authority to appoint an acting director. And the acting director could try to initiate a new regulatory process to stay or modify the final rule and to try to do that before the deadline uh, for compliance with the arbitration provision is reached. Now, the president would have three ways he could try this under the Federal Vacancies Reform Act. First, the president could try to appoint the person who is Cordray's deputy. Um, but my understanding is that his deputy is a strong supporter of the final rule, so there's very little, if any, chance that he would take an administrative step to try to stay or change the final rule. A second option is that the president could choose a lower ranking non-confirmed official within the CFPB and have that person deemed to be the acting agency head. Um, that's possible, but it's unlikely, I think, that uh, a subordinate official like that would try to um, have a fundamental change in a very important regulation simply because that person would lack the political support to do it. Um, the, uh, that person would have to run around and try to gain support, um, but he's unlikely to find it in the executive branch. And so um, I think the chances and, and Republicans in Congress probably would feel the same way. So I think a lower ranking official simply would not have the clout to take a step like that. The most um, uh, possible of all the outcomes is that the president could exercise his authority to appoint to the, be the head of the CFPB, an officer of another agency who has already been confirmed by the Senate. And given the structure of the CFPB and the flow of authority in the financial regulatory area within the executive branch, um, such an official would likely be a um, confirmed but lower ranking official in the Treasury Department. And that person would have access to the Treasury and through Treasury to the White House to try to come up with the political support that might be needed within the administration to adopt a provision that would stay, modify, or revoke the final rule. The problem that person would have is the timing necessary to go through the rulemaking process that's necessary to um, change the existing arbitration rule. Essentially, uh, under the standard model that's followed by the agencies, uh, to prevent the final rule from going into effect, uh, the acting director would have to conduct two rulemakings. First, uh, issue a notice of proposed rulemaking and then conduct a very short um, review of the comments proposing to stay the rule pending con further consideration of its terms. Um, that's been done frequently um, when the uh, Trump administration is proposing to roll back administrative rules, especially rules that are already being sued upon in court. And so the first step is usually a process that can take somewhere between 45 and 60 days to have the issuance of a stay. Once, a fi once that uh, final rule is issued, the agency head then could move to the second rulemaking, which would be substantive in nature, issue a notice of proposed rulemaking on a rule to amend the substantive provisions of the final rule. Once again, this would go through public comment. Um, 
the rules uh, that is ultimately proposed would have to be consistent with the study, as the study has been reinterpreted by the new administration. And as Andy pointed out, it had to have to be in the public interest and for the protection of consumers. That's a lot of work for an agency to do on a complex rule like this within a few months. Um, and with an 800-page uh, preamble to a rule, you know it's complicated, and the agency would be well aware from the depth of the arguments put forth in the preamble that the people who support the rule have considered all these options and that they would have to work overtime to come up with arguments that would stand, would withstand the um, anticipated attack from the proponents of the rule that would come in litigation challenging any um, action by the acting director to adopt a new substantive rule. Um, so that's the general way that the um, um, process would work. As you can see, it would be complex and time consuming. There also is an X factor there because there are many other rules ahead of this one that have been reconsidered by the administration and where the agency heads have tried to go through the stay process or have tried to skip the stay process by coming up with good arguments that would allow them to get past it. All you can say about those cases is they're still being litigated in court and the jury is not in yet. Nobody knows if there are shortcuts available. So while technically there could be an administrative process, it's likely to be a long and challenging one for which the, um, the relevant consideration probably would be whether that administrative process would be greater in length than the time needed to get a uh, outcome in the litigation that's likely to be filed, almost certain to be filed. John, um, one, one thought I have about all of this, and I, in, you know, we should never discount the role of politics, especially when we talk about the CFPB. Um, and I don't know if you have a sense of how, if the Bureau was to say have some kind of acting director, whether that person is David Silberman, the current deputy, or somebody else who came in through Treasury or some other mechanism, um, that person would have to be able to not only engender support within the agency to take on this very expedited re-review, but that would also have there'd also be concerns about what that would do in Congress, especially when you consider that the CFPB is the brainchild of Elizabeth Warren. And I don't know if you've given any thought to how those external politics, even if they're not directly linked to the Bureau's work, could affect that the ability of the Bureau to actually revamp a rule like this. I think the answer is everything is related to everything else, and they would be traded off against each other. If there needs to be a fix because of uh, uh, ultimate determination that the um, current constitution of the um, um, uh, CFPV violates the appointments clause, uh, that could add to the mix and complicate it still further. But your point is well taken. Um, everything that con concerns the CFPB could be traded off or would be affected by decisions on any other part of the uh, uh, CFPA's um, authorizing statute. Yeah, I mean, it just strikes me that, you know, when you hear um, people talk about, you know, Richard Cordray's replacement, it's such a politically charged topic um, that, you know, it, it engenders all of this support from the Democrats in the Senate, including Chuck Schumer and others. Um, and then, of course, it also engenders a lot of support from folks like, Hen or, uh, opposition from folks like Henserling, um, you know, Health Financial Services Committee Chair, and it just strikes me that something like this would really, um, you know, put put all of this into a political cauldron in a really explosive way. Um, you know, not that that's new or different, but it could slow things down even more. It certainly would bring everything to a boil. And yeah. That, and I think, as you're right, you make the right point, gridlock is the usual um, um, most likely outcome in a situation like that. It certainly would take substantial floor time to um, change that outcome. So once again, floor time and whether um, consideration of CFPB issues would knock out infrastructure reform or, or tax reform will be a, um, uh, a great consideration, especially the, toward the end of this year and the start of next year. And then I think finally, we you started, you touched on this a little bit, but litigation um, and, you know, some thought about how that affects or potentially affects challenges. Yes. The, uh, this is all going to be projection based on 40-something years of having looked at Administrative Procedure Act challenges to agency rules. There are some salient features of the rule that lead um, people with APA experience to be able to um, think about at least the options that the proponents of, of legal challenges would bring to the final rule. And I'll try to lay out some of these just to give you a sense of what I think the salient points are 
and what the most um, barbed attacks on the rule are likely to look at. As Andy pointed out, there's a study requirement in the uh, statute. This Dodd-Frank requires the uh, CFPB to conduct a study and says that the final rule must be consistent with the study. As Andy pointed out, the study is credit card centric. There's less information and in some cases much less information collected on other products and services. Uh, that observation leads directly to one of the key points, one of the great unknowns in litigation, which is what will the legal challenges do? Will they take on the entire rule as a whole? Or will some people decide to bring product by product challenges to the, um, um, the regulation of their particular industry on the ground that there simply is not enough evidence in the record to support imposition of a prohibition on arbitration provisions on that particular product area? In an unusual step, the CFPB admits in the preamble that the data and methodologies available don't allow for an economic analysis of the optimal level of compliance on a market by market basis. So that basically would flag one of the lead points that the um, challengers to some of the smaller markets would make, which is you just don't have enough evidence in your study to justify doing this. So that's one thing to watch out for and we'll cover the rest of my presentation. Is the challenge going to be overall, is it going to be product by product, or is it going to be both? And is it going to be both in a number of lawsuits? Uh, the second point that will govern the litigation is the substantive standard that will be applied. Um, Congress said that the um, rule that's applied must serve the public interest. Um, it must be in the public interest and for the protection of consumers. The public interest trust is the broadest and most deferential rule that's been recognized by the Supreme Court. Um, the agency rule can be upheld if it serves the public interest. And in a series of Federal Communications Commission's cases in particular, the public interest has been defined very broadly, and the Supreme Court has been loath to second-guess the agency as to what something as broad and ambiguous as public interest means. So this is, um, it, it, I think it's going to be difficult to persuade a court to rule that something is not in the public interest. I think the courts will look for some other way to address the substance of the rule because reopening the public interest question this late in the game after 80 years of rules having been upheld on this basis would really work a revolution in one area of jurisprudence. One of the areas that will be heavily covered is also something Andy discussed at length, the cost-benefit analysis provision. As he correctly pointed out, the rule require, the statute requires that the CFPB consider the potential benefits and costs to consumers including the potential reduction of access to consumer financial products or services for consumers. But it's just a consideration requirement. There is no requirement that the benefits to consumers must exceed the costs to regulated entities of the prohibition on arbitration provisions. As long as it's considered and as long as the um, agency has provided a uh, rational justification for its decisions, the CFPB can go ahead even if the courts ultimately were to conclude that the costs exceeded the benefits. Uh, that is established in um, uh, a case called Michigan v. EPA uh, from 2015, which was the last time Justice Scalia had the right uh, and ability to write on um, um, the uh, cost-benefit provision. Um, and this is something that the Supreme Court has taken up um, increasingly seriously in the last 15 years or so, that costs and benefits must be considered but they've never been able to figure out a rule that would govern whether benefits must exceed costs because then you'd have to decide how to measure benefits and how to measure costs. So the Supreme Court has stopped at a midway position that as long as the agency is rational in its consideration and has articulated a reasonable justification, the courts will uphold the rule. So cost benefits will be uh, widely discussed, but I'm not certain whether the court would go further and say um, uh, that the um, 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 that the benefits must exceed the cost. I think this would be an odd case to, in which to try to cross that major threshold. And anticipating that that might be the issue, the uh, CFPB uh, put in multiple places in the preamble to the final rule that it finds that the benefits of the rule substantially outweigh the cost to providers of coming into compliance with the prohibition standard. So let's get finally to the provision that we think is are most likely to provide a basis for challenges to the final rule, which is um, um, the arbitrary capricious clause, as it's known to um, 
uh, Administrative Procedure Act um, denizens. And the usual meaning of arbitrary and capricious to uh, APA practitioners is the, like the golf gods playing golf. It's unbelievable how many things that the courts can go off on with no prediction that they determine as arbitrary and capricious. It's heavily fact-based and it's very difficult to predict in advance. And as a result, it is the dream of all uh, appellate advocates in the uh, Administrative Procedure Act space, because this is one place where uh, how you present facts in an otherwise cold record really can make a huge difference. Um, what, are we, what can we anticipate about the litigation with assurance this far out? Well, the first thing we can predict is the litigation will be complicated and lengthy. It will be um, filed in the district courts to begin with, and then later taken to the courts of appeals. So it'll take a minimum of two years, I think, in order to get a resolution of a suit like this. Uh, as I said, one of the great unknowns is whether there will be challenges on a product-by-product -product basis or whether there will be global challenges only, or maybe both. Um, that, leads, that unknown leads to a different question, which is, well, how many lawsuits are there going to be challenging this? Since it's in district courts, multiple cases can be filed, and unless too many are filed, they won't be consolidated in one court for resolution. So the uh, challengers to the rule may work with each other and decide how to proceed separately, how to file multiple suits that um, raise multiple challenges to the rule. The benefit of multiple suits is that you get more chances to hit a nerve with the judge, and you also get to raise more arguments that the judge called upon to resolve that argument will be able to manage. The judge will be able to think about it and make a rational decision about it and won't be overwhelmed as he might be if there were you know, eight or 10 different challenges filed. So the number of lawsuits and where they'll be filed is open, is an open question. And I, finally, another key question, key for those of you who actually are gonna to have to comply with the rule if it's upheld, is will the challenger seek and obtain a preliminary injunction, an injunction against the prohibition on arbitration clauses pending appeal? That's one that will have substantial consequences consequence to you and will also affect what might have to be done if uh, a couple of years down the line, the litigation is successful and you have the opportunity to undo what you had to do with your customers the first time that the rule was put through, and that is, um, will you want to take the risk of offending customers by overtly revoking something that you were for, that you had to put in place at one time? So the, the preliminary injunction is likely to be a key phase of the litigation, um, but it's impossible to predict that now because in order to do that, you need to know what the arguments will be and make an assessment of the arguments. And so, general injunctions in that context are not easy to get, isn't that true? That's right. You have to show that you have a, a strong possibility of winning on the merits of the case and that the, uh, the benefits of an issuing an injunction will exceed the harm to the public interest and the harm to the people <coughs> who um, uh, uh, would benefit from the new rule. And the CFPB thought about that, and it uh, also put into the preamble a broad description of the benefits that the um, consumers would receive um, from compliance by regulated entities. And they picked up several market failures. One is asymmetric information, the theory that the provider knows a lot more <coughs> about the effect of the arbitration clause than the consumer does. Second, insufficient deterrence. Uh, the CFPB uh, stated its best answer to the question um, whether there are reduced incentives for regulated entities uh, that have arbitration provisions in their contracts to comply with the underlying laws or whether people are insufficiently attentive to their compliance with the underlying consumer protection law if they can arbitrate those clauses. And finally, um, the, um, um, the, um, uh, the CFPB said enforcement may be at less than optimal levels and um, that there should be more enforcement than there is now and that it's important to consumers to have um, uh, private attorneys generals, class action plaintiffs, um, uh, involved heavily in bringing lawsuits um, to try to provide the deterrence um, that, um, that they think that is necessary um, and that would be a function of the abolition of the arbitration agreement provision. So the CFPB has done a good job of anticipating those points and the arguments it would make as to why continuation of the rule pending um, a resolution of the litigation would be in the public interest. 
So as I said before, this is going to be trench warfare, and the advocates are going to have a great time trying to figure out how to present the, the factual arguments that are available to them in a way that persuades the court to undermine the rule. I emphasize the facts because there is no cut across issue of statutory interpretation that would determine whether the rule as a whole was unlawful. And he articulated the challenges that are going to be presented, but those are pretty broad challenges, and especially with the public interest standard. Uh, I, I think it's going to be an uphill fight for the proponents to say there's a cut across legal rule that makes the whole rule um, um, inevitably uh, illegal. I think that they're going to have to fight this out on the ground and say, the, this is a factual challenge. The study was inadequate. The study doesn't provide a proper basis for subjecting uh, all these products to um, the prohibition on arbitration agreements. Or certainly, because there's so much less information available about many of these products, it doesn't provide a proper basis for subjecting uh, some of the smaller products, um, uh, some of the um, uh, ones in which um, uh, there's almost no record available. It can't justify subjecting them to the same kind of um, uh, strict uh, ban on arbitration provisions that you might be able to justify in another market where the facts are um, uh, better set out, where the analysis is there, uh, the algorithms that need to be used are there, and most important, the facts are there. Um, to follow up on this, much of the CFPB's analysis was based on abstract economic principles, such as uh, market failures and uh, what constitutes an optimal level of deterrence. Um, and the deterrent effect is where the CFPB, at the end of the day, I think is going to have to hang its hat. Um, there's a major risk to the CFPB there. Um, the CFPB did not consider the deterrent effect of its own recent enforcement actions in compelling compliance. Uh, and that's a significant um, amount of money. The figure I've seen is uh, in a Tulane Law Review article is that in the last year for which data was available, 2015, the CFPB recovered $6 billion worth of um, 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 rewards or $6 billion worth of remedies for consumers. That's an enormous number, even in markets that are this big. And it leads to the question whether the CFPB overestimated the potential benefits of the rule by underestimating the existence of the CFPB, the essentially unlimited um, resources that are available to the CFPB by virtue of its um, exemption from the appropriations process, and whether the CFPB's existence is sort of a finger on the scale that um, tilts the balance that might otherwise exist and would the balance that was reflected in the data that was collected by the um, CFPB as part of the study. That's fascinating what you're saying. Um because it's interesting, right, the, the report, the study that they um, authored um, that is the predicate for this rule under 1028 doesn't consider the deterrence effects of their, of their a very effective enforcement regime if you define effective by <clears throat> looking to the sheer number of, you know, quantity and, and, and amounts of money they've collected, but also the sheer number of enforcement actions they've brought. And just today, right before this webinar, we received um, – a blast from the CFPB about their their semi-annual supervisory report, which also involves collecting right. uh, what is it, 14? I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's a it's a fair amount of money as well. So it's to John's point, um, 14 million, I think, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to John's point, that's a really interesting issue and one that I think would um, cut a lot of different interesting ways if it was litigated, right? I mean, you could see it would kind of put people in odd places. The bureau would have to be defending the rule, but also dealing with the reality of its own effectiveness and having to manage that while also defending the rule. It's a really interesting strategy. Um, it's actually fascinating to yeah. see how that rolls itself out. So there are, risks, <laughs> there are risks throughout here to the CFPB, and one of them is that by the design of the study, which is one big study which covers all regulated products, whether they're in what the FBI always calls a one-fall, all-fall situation which is if part of the rule goes down, does that drag everything else with it? That is, does the uh, CFPB have to win in every regulated market? Certainly, um, that's going to be um, a substantial issue um, that people look at when they figure out the effect of this on credit cards, because the credit card rule may be like the Jupiter of the solar system. If something happens to Jupiter, it may affect everything else. Um, one last point. This is not something that would be of interest to people who are actually um, running businesses. <coughs> Um, 
that are going to be affected by the rule, but will be critical to the lawyers. And the higher up in the appellate system you get, the more important it's going to become, which is uh, there's a disconnect here. Many of the costs of regulated entities that they'd have to pay if they had to come into compliance and um, get rid of their uh, arbitration provisions, those costs are quantifiable. You can calculate what the uh, uh, payments were to class action plaintiffs in the last year. Uh, the benefits to consumers are largely unquantifiable. How can you say what the optimal level of deterrence is? How can you say how much money the uh, consumers might save if there were no arbitration provisions? Must, much of this is either unknowable or unquantifiable. And the courts, especially the appellate courts, will be very reluctant to take a first step which tries to um, uh, address the problem which has been coming for 40-something years, which is how do you balance costs and benefits when some of the costs and some of the benefits are known and others are unquantifiable? That's another mega step that would have to be taken before the courts could ever adopt a rule that would say it's mandatory for agencies to engage in a cost-benefit analysis. And that's an issue that's highly likely to be presented in this case, I think, and one that I think the courts, especially the Supreme Court, would be extremely reluctant to get into on this kind of record. Um. This is really interesting, and I, I have one follow-up thought on what you just said, John, and it's something we touched on earlier um, when we were speaking about when you start talking about cost-benefit analyses, you've got really a few ways to look at that, all of which strikes me as relatively abstract, not necessarily susceptible to pure quantification, but then you've also got this unknown innovation, um, the idea that the financial services markets, so-called fintech industries, um, you know, as we speak, people are coming out to the marketplace, which is a good thing, with really new, interesting, neat products, but those products are consumer-facing, and they are, in fact, not exempt from this rule, at least in many cases. And so how does this impact innovation? And I would imagine that would go into any cost-benefit analysis, and I have no idea how you monetize or quantify that, um, because that's kind of the you know known unknown, as some people would say. Um, and that strikes me as something else that's interesting here, and not just a legal, a litigation issue, but a policy issue. Um, and one that, you know, if you talk to, to companies that are in this space that are regulated by or likely regulated by this rule, they will tell you in depth that this is not only affecting their risk management as to products and services here and now, but it's, it's affecting their willingness to take certain products to market in the future, to invest in R&D, um, especially large market participants. Um, so these are all interesting issues. One, one thing I'd like us to speak a little bit about before we... Um, close today's webinar are a couple of things that I think are important for companies affected by this rule to be thinking about. One is how could the Bureau go about enforcing it? Um, and two, what are some of the things you can do as a company to address uh, consumer complaints and other issues that might give rise to a Bureau inquiry, um, whether it's an enforcement investigation or, or probably in, in many cases more likely a supervisory exam. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about that and I'm going to have, I'm going to start the conversation, but I'm going to have all of my um, colleagues here uh, participate. Um, and I note that <laughs> at the outset, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's Enforcement Authority, which is under subtitle E um, of Title 10, provides that the agency has a number of different remedies when it seeks to bring an enforcement action. That's under Section 1055 of the, of the Dodd-Frank Act. Um, it can seek, obviously, restitution. Um, and disgorgement of ill-gotten gains, restitution being the idea that a company has to pay back some amount of money to consumers who were allegedly injured by the conduct, um, a kind of a but-for analysis, um, disgorgement being the idea that if the company um, made a certain amount of money from the alleged conduct, they have to pay all or some of it back, um, and then, of course, civil money penalties, which are part and separate from an injury analysis. And when John um, gave up the $6 billion number before and, and, and cited the Tulane Law Review article, that's what he's talking about. So to date, the Bureau has, has gotten somewhere in the neighborhood of $6 billion worth of civil money penalties, uh, restitution, and disgorgement, um, either back to consumers in some direct or indirect way, um, which is really a significant number when you think the Bureau is six years old. That's a billion dollars a year. Um, which is which is probably a pretty um, you know given its relative size it's a pretty small agency compared to say the Department of Justice that's a really um, big number um, but that's how the bureau enforces uh, its its laws and its rules um, 
And of course, it also has the ability to bring injunctive relief, as we all know, and you know, prohibitions against conduct going forward, affirmative requirements, the companies do certain things. My guess is that in this case, the rule um, <coughs> would result in some probably supervisory finding first, where it would be found that a company had impermissibly not followed the rule, either because they hadn't um, appropriately changed the language in their consumer-facing contracts, or they were not necessarily inclined to ever do that. And then they would look out at the world and say, okay, well, what's the harm to consumers? It may be hard to monetize that injury, so this is the kind of injury or alleged misconduct that probably would be more susceptible to a civil money penalty. But the point is there is some you know, pretty strong enforcement apparatus here, um, which of course is public, and anything in supervision is, is non-public. So we've got those things to consider. Um, we also have kind of more generally how companies can prepare themselves for this. And I, and I, you know, we, we've talked about challenges facing the rule. We've talked about um, some of the some of the ways that um, you know we, we can forecast the the effect that this might have on businesses going forward, innovation, risk management. Um, but some of the other things that I think are helpful to think about are, you know, how do we manage risk associated with this? Not not in terms of um, just you know baking into the price. Um, perhaps an additional risk, but also more generally, if you're a company and you're getting a spate of complaints about X, Y, or Z practice, this is now potentially one more practice um, that you could be complained about, and, and it could find its way onto the consumer complaint portal at the CFPB. Um, and Peter, I know, has, has worked with me on a number of matters where this has been an issue, so I'm going to turn to you first and have you maybe walk us through some thoughts on how we can go about minimizing risks to um, in the complaint space. Sure, absolutely. So I think yeah, on, on the enforcement and sort of damages remedy side, I think what you see in the rule is the Bureau kind of views it as what should be kind of a, a one and done. You know, there, there is no private right of action. Um, essentially, if you violated what would, would become and what will be 12 CFR 1040, you would violate the CPA and be subject to, you know, the Bureau's authority there, similar to, to UDAP. So I think they anticipate potentially <laughs> having to, to step in or having state attorney general step in and make sure people are complying but not necessarily an ongoing you know enforcement situation where there'd be you know issues cropping up where you try to comply but you didn't quite make it um, issues like that and, and yeah I was going to add you know, keep in mind not continuing to use an arbitration clause with a class action waiver that's been banned by the law is almost certainly going to be viewed by the CFPB as an intentional violation. What happens a lot of times with, with CFPB is, you know, the, the rules are confusing or they're complicated. Someone makes a good faith effort to comply but somehow falls short. Mm -hmm. I think a company that's, that's deliberately going forward and continuing to use arbitration clauses that the CFPB has said are prohibited after the compliance date would be at risk of, a, of an intentional violation. And there the CFPB has the discretion to go up to a million dollars a day in mm -hmm. penalties. Yeah. So just something to keep in mind. Absolutely. That's a really good point, um, and we'll end it with that point. Um, I want to remind everybody that this um, <coughs> presentation is available on our website. It will be downloadable, um, both the recording and the slides that have accompanied our discussion today. I want to really thank all of my terrific colleagues um, here at Venable who participated in our webinar today. John Cooney, Andy Arculin, and Peter Frechette. I'm Allison Baker.